Hi everyone and welcome. I'm Joe Brady, your host today, and I've been really looking forward to sharing today's program with you. We're going to explore showing the passage of time in a single photograph. Now, to provide some balance to the topic, I'll show you some examples of some bucolic flowing waterfalls, and then we'll counter that with some city scenes. So today's broadcast is sponsored by Sakonic, Benro, and Enduro. These are the manufacturers of some of the gear that made possible some of the photography we're going to see today. The images I'll share with you today range from, oh, three second exposures to some that are over 10 minutes. Now that means I wanted each capture to be its best, because a lot of time was expended for each shot, and I wanted them to be their best possible. Now in some cases, I was using long exposure noise reduction on my camera. So I might have been doing a 10 minute exposure with my Sony Alpha 99, and if I'm doing that in low light, I'll use the long exposure noise reduction. And what that does is after it takes its exposure, it takes another exposure for 10 minutes with the shutter closed. What that does is it reads the base noise level of the sensor and then subtracts it out of the image. So some of the images took over 20 minutes to process. Well, if I'm going to sit there for 20 minutes, I want that shot to be good. I don't want to have to do it again. So first, let's review the gear I used during these shoots. And then we'll visit a couple of great locations and put everything to use. Now, first of all, my good friend, the Sakonic 758DR meter. Why? Well, a couple reasons that I absolutely love this meter. First of all, it's two meters in one. It's got an incident reading meter and a spot meter that I can look through. There's actually two sensors. This piece of equipment gives me the information I need to get a perfect exposure under pretty much any situation and we're going to see this in action in the field. Next, I used the Benro Travel Angel 2. You're going to see this as well. If I had to live with one tripod, this would be it. It weighs practically nothing, but it's an extremely stable system. In fact, in addition, one of the legs unscrews and you can use it as either a walking stick or a monopod. My third piece of support gear is this little thing. This is an Enduro hi-hat, and we're going to see a lot more of this later. And you might wonder, well, what is this going to do? I asked myself that first, and then once I started using it, I was done. In fact, now I have to buy it. Now, in order to make our long exposures happen, we had to use something called neutral density filters. Now, if this is something you're not familiar with, a neutral density filter is basically, well, it's basically sunglasses for your camera. Now, this one's kind of extreme. In fact, I bet to you guys on the video, it looks black. I used two different filters, and a 0.9, which is three stops, and what's something called an ND400. This is a nine-stop neutral density filter. And we're going to see this in action for some real long exposures. Now, the common uh, gradations of ND filters that you'll see a lot of times on the market are 0 0.3, 0 0.6, and 0 0.9. That is one, two, and three stops respectively. I added the nine stop filter to that and I've had a blast with it. Each of those cuts down the amount of light and that's what allows for long exposures. The last important piece was using a cable release. Now this is my timing cable release. I can use it just to fire the camera. I can uh, lock it on bulb mode and it will start counting or I can set it up as an intervalometer which will be a subject for another day. When I first got to my location I actually went to shoot without it because I wanted to show you you can do that. I used the camera's timer uh, just with a couple of second delay, fire the shutter, let it count off, and then let the camera do the work. That worked fine up to exposures of 30 seconds. When I wanted to go longer, then I had to have that. So let's kind of set the scene. Let's head out to our first location. We're going to Dingman's Falls, Pennsylvania. It's just south of the town of Milford. It's in the Delaware uh, Water Gap area. And the first thing you should do when you get to a place is evaluate the scene. So let's do that and we'll start to take a closer look at the gear. Let's head out to Pennsylvania. So here we're, we're here today to talk about some gear for photographing long exposures, some time exposures, and we're going to do flowing water today. And they're not an official sponsor, but one of the other important pieces of gear. Got to have some coffee. So uh, we DD'd on the way in. So we're here today at Dingman's Falls in the Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area, and it's absolutely a gorgeous setting. We've got a couple of different falls to choose from. Actually, we're going to photograph three of them today. 
This is the lower falls, much more peaceful, but lots of little things to detail in on. And one of the nice things about photographing waterfalls is if you're looking to sell photography, it's something that always sells. There's something primal about water. It's life-giving. It's just the kind of thing that always attracts people. However, you got to be really careful with the shutter speed. And we'll show some examples of what happens if you photograph a waterfall at, say, 125th of a second versus 5 or 6 seconds. Big difference there. Obviously, we're going to create a flow. And the beauty of doing that is you're getting a sense of time passing. Now, in order to do that, you obviously have to have a real stable base. And we're going to talk about some tripods today. If I had to live with one tripod, this would be it. I love this thing. This is the Benro Travel Angel 2. Uh, it weighs practically nothing. This is a carbon fiber tripod, and it also folds up into nothing. I can put it in my suitcase. I've got it here attached to my little sling bag, and it's just the greatest traveling companion. I'll just go ahead and open it up here. So I've got my Sony Alpha 99 with me today. I've got a 24 to 70 28 and a 70 to 200 28, which is a fairly hefty lens. This tripod head has no problems with that. Now these twist lock legs, by the way, if this is something new to you, if you're used to those clip legs, once you learn how to use these, I think you'll actually find you like these a lot better. One of the problems with the clips, for me anyway, is particularly when it's very cold out, I find them very hard to open and close, particularly if I forgot to bring gloves. The trick to these is just don't twist them all that far. You've got three sections here, just grab all of them, quarter turn towards you, and all the legs come out. One, two, three, quarter back, and that's it. I've got a locking point here on the top of the head, and that's as quick as it is. So just all three, pull out, quarter turn back. And that's all you have to do. You don't have to go real far. In fact, a good friend of mine, unfortunately, had the TSA take his tripod legs apart. They wanted to see what was in the tripod, and they had a heck of a time trying to get it back together again. So don't do that. Don't take the leg completely off. Just a quarter turn either direction, and you end up with a really nice, stable platform. I can put all my weight on this. The legs aren't going anywhere. That's a real important consideration when we're going to do the kinds of things we're going to do today. I brought a nine-stop neutral density filter with me today. Nine stops. So, wow, how does that work out? How do you calculate nine stops open from your exposure? We're going to see how to do that. Because I've got my meter with me, and we're going to do just a little bit of math, I promise. So let's get ourselves set up. Let's find a great location. We're going to do two things. We're going to shoot some overall shots of the falls. But again, for me personally, what I find is if you shoot a big wide falls like this, there's nowhere for the viewer to really kind of zone in on. You find yourself looking around. There's not a clearly defined subject. I like to pick out individual features of these falls, narrow in on those. And it's much easier for the viewer to follow. So in a case like this where I've got, oh, I don't know how many. I haven't counted them. There must be a dozen different little cascades here. I can shoot each one of those individually and get 12 different points of view, 12 different little waterfalls from this one location. And this is just one of three falls. So this place is phenomenal. By the way, it's uh, third week of September here. Leaves are just starting to change. In fact, I'm going to be doing a workshop here in about four weeks. Can't wait to see this place once the leaves change. It's going to be absolutely beautiful. I'll definitely be back here. So let's set up and get some shooting done. All right, so beautiful scene, wasn't it? Uh, really enjoyed it. In fact, I, I love that spot so much that I actually took a workshop class there this past weekend and we had a blast. So just a couple of questions. And again, if you've joined us late, take advantage of the chat room. We'll see your questions coming through. We'll, they'll send some of them over to my iPad and we can address them right here. Now, first, a really good question. Somebody asked, is it necessary to use the mirror lockup mode when shooting time exposures? That's a really good idea, and it's actually something I forgot to talk about, in part because, again, one of the reasons that I've chose this camera, the, the Sony Alpha 99, is the mirror doesn't move. It's got what's called a semi-transparent mirror. So I can shoot a long exposure and not have to worry about that mirror bounce when it pops up. So the answer is yes. If you're familiar with using your camera's mirror up mode, really good idea. Get the mirror up first for that long exposure, let the camera settle down, and then you can open up the shutter. Let's see, another question was, and 
And wow, there's a term in here. I'm not sure if I'm familiar with it. Let's see, film. Does the Sekonic meter automatically account for reciprocity with various films? I said, films? I remember film. I'm only kidding. Um, it does not automatically do that. Uh, that's something that you're going to have to dial in uh, with your various films. You're going to have to look that one up. As far as digital goes, I, my experience has been there isn't any reciprocity failure uh, with digital. And by the way, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, uh, what happens is normally if, when you get to real long exposures with film, the exposure no longer becomes linear. So if you calculate out that you might need a two minute exposure, well films don't respond linearly up to that and you might need to add a little bit more time. With digital I found that is not the case. Uh, someone asked, do we start with the color checker passport? Uh, always a good idea to use the color checker. I actually, in preparing this presentation, uh, did a short video on profiling, creating a custom camera profile uh, because I was going to be using these big ND filters. And interestingly enough, I found out that these filters did not really cause uh, much of a noticeable color shift. But yes, color checker passport for creating a camera profile and to have a white balance reference. I understand that white balance is a very subjective thing when you're doing landscapes, particularly when there's no sky involved, uh, but it's always a good idea to have a reference for it. Let's see. Uh, somebody asked, which lens is... Which, I'm not sure exactly how this question means, which lenses that are stable on this tripod? This tripod will handle quite a bit of weight. I'm sure, I believe it's listed at uh, eight pounds uh, for the combination. Uh, I frequently use this both with my entire camera system with the 2470. I also use a 70 to 200 28 on here with the lens mounts right to the tripod. Very stable system. I'd recommend go take a look at the Benro site and you can find out those details. All right, so somebody asked pros and cons of using a variable ND filter, a variable neutral density filter. Pros and cons of it, well, the pro is you can have one filter and as you spin it, you're gonna change the density of the filter and be able to get those adjustments. Downside, one is you don't know exactly where you are, so it makes the calculation a little more difficult. Secondly, they're expensive. That's the big thing. Uh, yes, you only have to buy one filter, but you have one really expensive filter. What I have here, uh, my nine stop, is a Hoya, it's called an ND400. And with the nine stop filter, these are about $75. Uh, in comparison, some of the really nice variable ND filters like the Singray are $350 to $400 for a single filter. And if that gets dropped or scratched, you are out of luck. So um, I prefer, personally, to have a single stop filter, but it really, it is a personal preference. Uh, so let's see, a couple, another question. Somebody asked, is there a loss of image sharpness uh, when using an ND filter? And would a polarizing filter have a similar effect to an ND if you don't own an ND filter? Okay, first of all, uh, do you lose sharpness? That is gonna be affected by the quality of the glass. When you buy a $75 filter, it's gonna be pretty good. Uh, the lower density ND filters, I haven't really noticed. Uh, I've been using a, a Tiffin a 0.9, which is a three stop. It's been perfectly clear. Uh, if you buy some kind of discount filter, then all bets are off. If you spend 10 bucks for a filter, do you want to put a $10 piece of glass on front of your $2,000 lens? Probably not. Now, if you don't have an ND filter, can you use your polarizer? And the answer is yes. A circular polarizer at full strength Typically, they are about two stops, so it would be the same as a 0.6 ND. But you're going to find if you want to get real long exposures, and you're probably going to need a little bit more. Uh, let's see. Uh, and yes, circular polarizing filter again. Okay. Let's continue on. There's some more questions coming through, but there's a lot to see today, so let's continue on for now. So we've got our tripod. We've seen that in the, in the uh, scene. I don't think I showed it in the scene here, but uh, in this particular tripod, another thing I really like about it is that this leg screws off and you can use it as a monopod or as a walking stick. In fact, even in the box, there's a little wooden head with a compass in it if you happen to get lost. And having a stable platform is really important. You've got to have a flexible and sturdy base. Uh, and then we have our light meter to give us the perfect exposure. Now let's take a look and see what we have to do to capture the flow of water so that it has that smooth, silky, and peaceful look that the long exposure provides. Now, the numbers we use 
need to be somewhat flexible because the duration of the exposure is going to be influenced by how fast the water is moving. So let's take a look at some of the different feelings you can produce as that exposure time lengthens. So I set up in this spot because I want to kind of illustrate something and that's about shutter speed and how we're going to adjust that to the environment so that we can get our water to be nice and flowing. I'm going to take a shot first. I brought my ISO all the way up to 800 so I could get a fairly fast shutter speed because I want to show you what happens to the water when you do that. Yes, it works. The exposure is going to be correct, but it's not particularly uh, attractive, I don't think. There's something unnatural about it. So I set my, I have a Seconic 758 meter here. I've got my ISO at 800. I'm in full shade here, so I can just hold the meter out and get my reading. And if I go down to 5.6, I get an 80th of a second. So I'll put that in my camera. 5.6 at an 80th. Take my shot. By the way, I, <clears throat> I have my uh, timer on. It takes a couple seconds and takes the shot. And yeah, it gets the shot, and it's lovely, but you've got that kind of frozen moving water, which might be interesting, but it doesn't have the same effect and the same kind of peacefulness of flowing water. So I need to go a lot longer exposure than that. So I'm going to do that with a combination of aperture, ISO, and one of these. This is a neutral density filter. This is a three-stop neutral density filter. It's called a 0.9. A 0.6 is two stops. A 0.3 is one stop. Generally, the, the lower ones are more used for video to bring your brightness down a little bit. I think if you're going to want to do flowing water, three stops is probably where you're going to want to be. I also brought along with me, as I mentioned, a nine-stop filter, which is going to be a crazy amount of reduction. And basically, all a neutral density filter is, it's a kind of a pair of sunglasses for your lens. So I'm going to go ahead and put this on. Now, I know this is three stops. I'm going to bring my ISO down to 100, because I want a longer shutter speed. And I'm going to bring my aperture all the way up to f22, which is the smallest aperture I have on my lens. So I take my reading, and it tells me 1.6 seconds. That's fine. So let me go ahead and put that in. Change my ISO first, down to 100. I'm going to go to f22, and I'm going to go to 1.6 seconds. All right, so let me take my filter off again for a second, because that's the reading without the filter. And let's see how nicely 1.6 seconds does for this. It's actually probably going to work pretty nicely. 1.6 seconds, a nice long exposure for this. By the way, also notice on the tripod here, in order to get a little extra stability, what I've done is I've taken my sling bag and I've got it hanging from the base of the center column. This is going to add some weight and make things very stable. So let me go ahead and take a quick look at that. And yeah, actually at 1.6, it's pretty good. I want more though. I really want to have it completely smoothed out. So I'm going to put this on the front of my lens, a three-stop ND filter. Now I can either calculate it out in my head or I can use the meter to do it. I have my ISO2 button programmed for a three-stop adjustment. Or I could say, all right, okay, 1.6 to 3.2, that would be one stop. To 6.4, that would be two stops. To 12.8 or 13 seconds, that would be three stops. Okay, let's see what the meter says. I can just hit an ISO 2, and it says, oh, look at that, 13 seconds. So let's go ahead and set it up for 13 seconds. Okay, 13 seconds. Again, I have my timer on. I should be using a cable release. I'll use that later. And it's 13 seconds. Now, another thing that this particular camera does, and a lot of the high-end DSLRs do this, is when I take a 13-second exposure, when it's, gonna, when it's done, it's going to take another 13 seconds. What that's called is long exposure noise reduction. The camera takes its 13 second shot, then it takes another 13 second exposure with the shutter actually closed, and it calculates how much noise is showing up with no light coming in. Then it subtracts that from the original file to give you a much cleaner result. It's very cool. So let me take a look at our 13 second exposure. And oh, I like, I actually, I like it a lot. It's a very different feel than the one and a half second exposure where there was still a little bit of striations uh, in some of the water down here right in front of me, it completely smoothed it out. Now, this personal preference is somewhat subjective. You've got to find what works best for you. But that looked really nice.
Now the next thing I gotta work on is my composition. Where do I wanna focus on? Now I did bring my longer lens. I have my 70 to 200. Not something I used to photograph waterfalls with, but now I find myself doing it more and more. Because, as you see this entire beautiful scene here, if I photograph the entire thing, it might document the scene, but there's not a single focal point. Your eye doesn't know where to go. And it might be a pleasant enough image, but it then just becomes a background without a clearly defined subject. What I wanna do is isolate out just a couple of these cascades so that they become the subject and I'm also going to try to position them that they're in a strong position compositionally wise. So I think the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on this one right in front of me. Then I'm going to start to section off this cascade here and see what we can come up with. So let's give that a try. Okay, a lot of good questions. Keep the questions coming, thank you for that. Doesn't that scene look peaceful? I don't know if that's the kind of thing you're into, but when I see these, it just relaxes me. So that's why after, uh, after we're done today, that's going back and hanging in my house. All right, couple great questions. Someone asked, um, why bother with mirror up if your exposure is, say, two minutes? Because then vibration from the mirror won't last long enough to show in the image. Probably true, if you're doing that long an exposure, Actually, probably anything from 15 seconds out, mirror lock isn't probably going to have much of an effect. Where I find mirror lock to be important is kind of a window. Generally, from anywhere from about a 30th of a second down to 10 seconds. In that range, it's really handy to have mirror lock, and it, it varies from camera to camera. But when that mirror flips out of the way, it does cause a bit of a bounce. And depending on how heavy your tripod and the support system you have, your head, and if there's any weight under the tripod, that mirror can cause problems. And it's more a problem the bigger camera you have. So again, real long exposure, right, two minutes and up, you're not gonna see it. But in that 30th to a 15th of a second, up to about 10 seconds, the mirror bounce can show up and cause a little bit of blur. Uh, someone asked, what do I think of stacking ND filters to increase the effect? Absolutely, with one caveat. Uh, a typical kit you can buy is a 0 0.3, 0 0.6, 0 0.9, which is one, two, and three stops. And you can, they all are, are all threaded, you can combine them. There's something you have to look out for though. As you start to combine them, they're gonna start to extend out beyond the lens, and you're probably gonna start to see a vignette. In fact, not even probably, you're going to see a vignette. You're gonna start to lose the corners, so you're gonna have to give yourself a little bit more room so you have some cropping space. Nothing wrong with it, but just keep that in mind. Uh, here's an interesting problem. Someone says they own a, uh, an EF 14 millimeter f2.8 lens. It won't accept round filters, so what do I suggest? For those of you not familiar with that type of lens, the front element, the front glass, actually extends out beyond the lens ring, so you can't screw on uh, filters onto that. Uh, there are companies that make holders that wrap around the barrel of the lens that stick out. Uh, Koken is one, for example. So I would do a search on that, and they have holders that will hold the filter out front a little further. Uh, someone asked, does the meter go up to F256, or will I have to interpolate? I'm not sure why you'd want a meter to go up to F256. I know my lens is kind of max out at F22. Uh, it's more of a timing thing. Um, this meter goes up to, I just checked, it's F161. Again, I'm not sure why you'd want that. Uh, but there will be a little bit of math involved when you get into the nine stop. And there's a video coming up where I'll go over that and I'll come back and talk about it again. Uh, someone asked about, what, about using live view with these very dark filters. That's gonna be camera dependent. Uh, this, the Sony camera that I use does have live view at all times and it does work. Uh, even on bulb or 30 second exposures, it does show you. So it will give you kind of a ballpark. I still rely on the number my meter gives me because I can't trust how exact the live view is gonna be, but it is a very handy piece. And yes, even with the nine stop filter on there, uh, my camera did work. Uh, someone asked, uh, which 
intervalometer uh, timer I'm using. Uh, this is just a generic uh, timer. I found it on Amazon. Uh, it's called a shoot timer. Um, I've found, I've tried the brand names and the non-brand names, and I find they all work pretty well. Uh, someone asked what lens am I using. During this shoot, there were two lenses that I used, uh, and you're going to see the long lens coming up. Uh, primarily, I used the 2470. When I wanted to get in close to the waterfall that was a little further distant, I went to the 70 to 200. Uh, I find generally that those are my two go-to lenses for probably 95% of what I do. I'll experiment with some super wide stuff when I need it, use something longer for nature, wildlife, but those two, the 24 to 70 and the 70 to 200, are my primary lenses. Let's see. Oh, here's another good question. So somebody says, with a long exposure, what about light coming in through the viewfinder? Can also be a problem with a lot of cameras. I don't, I don't want to sound boring about the Sony. Again, it's one of the reasons I use this as a landscape camera. The Sony viewfinder is electronic. It's not optical, so there is no light leak coming into the sensor. But yes, that can be a problem with certain cameras. Uh, you might have noticed that when you got your camera, it did come with a little cap that went over the viewfinder. So if you're going to be doing long exposures, you might want to put that cap over the viewfinder. You probably never knew what it was for. That's one of the things that it will stop. OK, so let's see. Someone asked, how do mirrorless cameras do with this kind of shot? Uh, that's a really wide question. I do have a couple of mirrorless cameras that I use, uh, and they do a very good job. Uh, I haven't had any problems with them. There's, since there's no mirror, uh, there's very little shake, and it's a matter of using good glass. All right, keep the questions coming. There's still more here, but I want to continue on keep things moving. Now, there's a couple of recommendations I have for friends and students when they arrive at a new location, and I'm sure you've done this. Pretty much everyone wants to sh start shooting as soon as possible. So when we arrive at a location, I usually wait for a few minutes before I say anything. You just get excited. You're seeing a place for the first time. Everybody wants to set up and start to use their camera. And typically, the photographs they take are usually pretty boring uh, because they're recordings of the entire scene. Yes, they document, look, I was here, but they're not great photographs. They might be nice, but because you're trying to encompass so much they generally make for an, a pleasant but uninspiring photograph. So after this has happened, I'll challenge the students, I'll challenge you as well, to stop, evaluate the scene. What is the light doing? Where is it? What are the strong subject points? What elements in that scene do the best job of describing the scene when they're going to be put in a photograph? In short, the question I always ask, why are you taking this picture? If you can't answer that most important question, why am I taking this picture, then perhaps you need to take a little closer look at composition, the details, and the flow of the image so that you can better define what you hope to say about the place. So let's head back to the falls and see what part composition and simplifying the subject bring to this type of photography. What I'm going to do now, another thing that's really nice when you're doing this, is to get a low point of view. So I'm collapsing my legs on the tripod, not my own, so that I can get the camera down lower and closer to the water. And when you're doing this, something else that's really important, and I'll show you this closer in the studio, but a really cool feature of this type of tripod head is this has an Orca Swiss style plate on top of it, but it also has this safety release here. So if I release the knob, I still can't get the camera off of the plate. What I need to do is pull it out and then give it another turn. That's a safety to keep your camera from ending up in the drink, which is definitely not something you want. So really nice feature. Put the camera on, tighten it up, and it's, it's really, really secure. But if by accident this gets loosened, the camera will wiggle a little bit, but it won't come off the plate. In order for that to happen, you have to pull out on the knob, then it comes off. More than once, I've had that kind of error in the past. You don't want to be dropping your camera. One of the other things I absolutely love about this particular camera, ever since I started shooting the Sony Alpha 99, I just can't think of shooting nature and landscape photography with anything else because it keeps me cleaner. You think, how? Why? Well, it's the only full-frame DSLR, 
that has a completely articulating LCD screen. So what that means is I can put this thing down on the ground or kind of in the water and I can change the screen so that I can look from above, see my framing, and it has a digital level built in it as well so I can see when the camera is perfectly horizontal. It sounds like a minor feature, but once you start using this, you can't, you can't give it up. It's absolutely amazing. The other thing I like is that this camera has an electronic viewfinder. That means it mimics what is going on on here, and it turns on as soon as I get my face near the viewfinder. What that means is if I want to preview some images before I leave a location, if it's bright and sunny, it's hard to see them on the LCD. But as soon as I put my eye up to the viewfinder, I get to see the captured images right through here. It makes a world of difference. You get a perfect view of what your file really looks like. So let's get some, uh, some low angle stuff. It's going to change the mood a lot. So you can see from here the advantage of having this flip out LCD screen on this camera. I don't have to get down on my knees in the rocks or crawl around in the river. I can see everything right here. And with the digital level, I can just do my adjustments. And when it's perfectly level, it shows green right on the LCD. So I get to compose. Again, another nice thing about this particular head, this is called a V-series ball head, is I can release the head on the bottom and then just rotate for panoramas as well. So I just want to frame and we have the action this time going down to the lower left. Just tighten it up. Take my shot and I don't have to get my knees on the rocks or all wet. If you haven't tried this, this is really cool stuff. Get yourself an ND filter, get yourself a cable release or Use your camera's timer built in. Just touch it and leave it go. You might want to seriously consider, if you're not using one, investing in a light meter. For the serious landscape photographer, Sekonic 758 is really the choice because of its spot metering abilities. And a little bit later, as the sun gets a little higher and comes down and it's hitting the water directly, it's going to make that water, the white parts of the water, extremely bright. And we don't want that to be clipping. So that's what we're going to use the meter to find out where that brightest part is, and then we'll adjust for that. So let me just take a look at my last image, and just it's very cool stuff. I'm just going to zoom in and get some details. Another thing when you're doing this kind of photography is it pays to have a decent amount in the frame that is the solid rocks, and in this case, some of the leaves sitting on it. Because having that really sharp, focused piece of the image with the water flowing by it puts it more in context. If you just zoom on flowing water, it can get kind of abstract. Not that there's anything wrong with that. That's certainly a valid option as well. But I find that to really get the effect of the flowing water, having that really super sharp, super crisp rock, in this case, we've got moss and lichens and the leaves there, just kind of counteracts or counterpoints the flowing water. And there's just something about that that speaks to you. So I moved over a little closer to the falls. The sun's getting a little higher. It's getting a little bit brighter over here. So I'm going to re-meter. <clears throat> now, I don't want to have any dappled sun actually hitting my dome. But where I am here, I'm still in full shade, so I'm safe. So now I'm getting, again, it's still at F22, uh, 8 tenths of a second. But that's without my filter, so three more stops. Now I'm at 6 seconds instead of 13 seconds. So as I mentioned before, what I want to do is I want to isolate some of these cascades because trying to look at them all at once just becomes overwhelming. And as a photograph, you really don't know where to look. So I'm going to zero in and I'm going to put them in, again, strong compositional points. Also, by having the camera low, just changing your point of view a couple of feet up or down is going to completely change the mood of the photograph. So I'm going to loosen up here. And again, you can see here the advantage of having this flip out LCD. Just going to re-meter while this is going on. Yep, six seconds at F22. I'm at 100 ISO. And this is, again, a three-stop neutral density filter. And I'm also going to open up a little bit. I'm going to override my meter in this case. I went from 
uh, six seconds to 10 seconds, which is two thirds of a stop. The reason I'm doing that is I have a lot of dark stuff in front of me. I've got some very dark wet rocks. I want to open that a little more. I know this camera can capture over three stops above the middle reading before it clips. So just going up two thirds of a stop is just going to change the mood a little bit. It's going to open up the shadows a little bit more. And there's, there are some times you want to override what the meter's saying because you got to combine the light falling on the scene versus what you're seeing in front of you. And since the face of these rock cliffs here is in even deeper shadow, opening that up will just open the shadows a little bit and I still am not in danger of clipping the whites because again, it was just two thirds of a stop. So let me see what we got there. Oh yeah, it's gorgeous. I hate leaving this spot. I could just sit here all day and do this. But we got two more falls to go explore, so let's do that. All right, and again, thank you guys for the great questions. You're, you're really challenging me, but you're really into it. These are great questions, and they're really taking this, this whole concept a little further. Someone mentioned that uh, they've been exposing for the shadows and doing an exposure compensation of minus two and a half, meaning closing down from there. And it gives me the same result as exposing for the light with opening up two and a half stops. What do I think about that? A couple of things on that. That will work fine, I suppose, if you're in a scene that only has five stops of tonal range. The problem's gonna be when you run into a scene that's got brighter highlights. The problem with digital photography, unlike film, and I assume we're talking about digital here, is that once you blow out a highlight, it's gone. Now, in film, it was okay to expose for the shadows because shadows were cl and went clear on film. Digital, it's the opposite way around. You, ha you have to decide what is it that is important in the scene. Do I really need this shadow detail, or is it more important that I maintain my highlights? If the highlights are important to the scene, I would prefer and I'd recommend metering for the highlights and opening it from there. Uh, if this is a subject that's a little something new to you, uh, that watched last week's or last month's webinar, we went over this in detail. We'll also see it here in just a bit. Uh, someone asked, they've never used an ND filter. Do I have to buy one for each lens I have? You don't have to. No, I'll show you. There's an easier, not maybe not easier, but it's a less expensive way to do it. Buy 77 millimeter filters. Uh, that, all my lenses are 77 millimeter. It's generally, until you get to really big giant lenses, the widest you're going to run into. What you can then buy are what are called step-down rings. Uh, and you can look for them online so that you can fit your 77 millimeter filter on a 67 or a 62 or a 57 or whatever you have. Uh, then you can buy a ring for each lens and they're 10 or 12 bucks and then use your filters. Uh, someone asked about the 13 second shot, what were my other settings? Had to think about that, then I realized my other settings were the same for every shot. 100 ISO, F22. Now, which leads into, someone said, if you had, and I loved your, uh, your characterization of the camera, if I have an itty bitty camera, isn't F22 gonna cause some diffraction problems? It might, you need to know what your camera does and what your lens is doing. Maybe F16 will be the answer or F14 will be the answer for that type of camera. For my lenses, F22 works perfectly. Now, another question, somebody asked, which is a better meter for someone who wants to do landscape and also does flash and strobes for portraits? Is my preference the 758 or the 478 DR? Yes, you pay more for this. This is always the, the meter that I will go to uh, in most situations. It does everything every other meter does. It does flash, it does spot, it does all of that stuff. 478 is a less expensive meter. It does not have the one degree spot meter, however, that the 758 has. And for me, for landscape, maintaining those highlights is what's critical for me. So I will always go to this meter. That said, if you're not, not a spot metering person, then the 478 does a great job at both incident and for controlling flash. Now to that, somebody, say, somebody asked another question. What, with long exposure around sunset, the light is changing, will the reader Will the reader, will the reading from the meter be correct? It's gonna depend on how long your exposure is, of course, and how close to sunset you are. If you're getting very close to sunset and you're doing a 30 minute exposure, then yes, you're gonna to have to compensate because it's gonna get dark quickly. If you're doing a 30 second exposure, then no, it's not gonna change enough uh, in most cases to make a difference. Uh, somebody asked, how do you manage to focus when you're using a nine stop neutral density filter? 
Strangely enough, it seems to work just fine. However, if your camera has problems with that, simple solution. Focus with the, the uh, filter off of the lens, turn off autofocus on your camera, then put the lens on. That would probably be the easiest way to do it. Um, let's see. Someone asked, do I bracket? And if not, why not? I don't bracket because I have one of these. I don't need to bracket. When you start to learn exposure and how to place the light in the scene, having a handheld meter eliminates it. And that comes really important down to one of the last questions that was answered during the last break, is why use one of these when I have such a good meter in my camera? The reason is, well, the two reasons. As good as the meter is in the camera, it's a reflective light meter. It can only measure the light coming back into the camera. It can't measure the light falling on the scene. If I point my camera at something very dark, remember your camera's meter is always gonna place what it sees in a middle gray or what it thinks middle gray is. So if you've got a very dark scene, it's gonna make that dark scene average out to middle gray, you're gonna overexpose. Conversely, if it's a very bright scene, maybe you're shooting on the sand or in the snow, it's gonna still try to make it middle gray and you're gonna end up grossly underexposed. By measuring the light falling on a scene with a handheld meter, I eliminate all of those variables. In addition, having the spot meter in here, it is a one degree spot meter. It's very tiny, so I can look at a piece of a cloud, find the brightest spot, or more importantly, the brightest spot that I need to maintain detail in with that meter. With a camera, the spot in the spot metering is gonna vary depending on the focal length of the lens. If I have a wide angle lens, it's gonna be this big giant thing, if I have a really long lens, it'll get pretty small, but most of us don't carry around a really long lens for this kind of shooting. So that's why I use a handheld meter. It eliminates bracketing, gives me all the information I want. And again, if you want to see all the possible ways to use this, I'll send you to our last Sekonic video, which was Metering the Landscape Part 2, where I go over all those possibilities. Oh, another good question. Someone asked about image stabilization on the lens. Do I turn that off? And the answer for me is, I never ever use image stabilization. I always turn it off, particularly for this kind of photography. What image stabilization does in the camera with the lens is it actually shakes the lens slightly to, to give you a little bit more stability for handheld shots. If you're using a tripod, you don't want image stabilization on. Image stabilization is good for Oh, occasionally I do performance art. I'll be shooting in a theater and I'll be shooting at relatively low shutter speed. Maybe I'll be shooting 30th of a second with a 200 millimeter lens and the ISO is cranked up to 3200. Then I'll use image stabilization. Everything else, no. It is always turned off because it actually detracts from the clarity of the image and you want to avoid that. All right, let's continue on. More questions, we'll get back to them. So, this first setting that we visited when we went to these falls, which was right here, just evaluating the scene when you get there, it did not have an extremely wide tonal range. There was no real bright pieces of sun coming through. And this is something you can quickly learn to judge by eye. There are times, however, when incident metering is not gonna be the best answer. And this frequently happens when you do have a very high contrast scene with some bright highlights that you absolutely have to maintain uh, without losing those details. And that's where the spot metering comes in. When you have these very bright highlights that need to be preserved, switch to spot metering. Spot metering can give you information about the edges of the scene, the light and dark, that are important for you to know when preparing for your digital capture. The incident meter tells you where the middle is. The spot meter tells you where the edges, light to dark, are. So again at Digman Falls, when we visited the main falls, at the top of the falls, it was actually now in sunlight. The bottom of the falls was in deep shadow. It was actually a very tough set of lighting conditions. So as I've said all the time with digital photography, keeping your highlights from clipping or blowing out is almost always something you want to avoid. So let's take one last visit to Dingman's Falls and see how we can approach metering this type of light. All right, so here we have Dingman's Falls. It's a beautiful scene, and right now, it's an absolute bear to try to photograph. Why? We've got deep shadows in front of us, the sun's starting to clear the trees, and we've got some bright highlights up in the top. 
probably more tonal range than our camera can handle, might even require an HDR. But we do want to get the best digital capture possible. So here's the procedure. Now I've got a three stop ND filter on here again, but I need to use the meter. I'm going to use the 758 and I'm going to spot meter and find the absolute brightest part of the scene. And I want to put that as far to the right in my exposure as possible without clipping it. So I just hold it in. I'm going to look at the white highlights on the water. I'm going to go up to the bright sky. I'm at F22 now, by the way. And it looks like the brightest piece of uh, getting in the scene is 1 25th of, is, I'm sorry, 25th of a second at F22. So 25th of a second, again, puts the highlights in the middle. I don't want them in the middle. I want them off to the right of the exposure. So I need to open up two and a half stops from there. And I'm going to call it three because I don't see any really specular whites, just a really bright blue sky. So I'm going to open up three stops to put the highlights on the right. And I need to open up another three stops because I have a three stop neutral density filter on here. Now, the Sekonic 758 only goes up to five stops. So I'll just need to open up one more stop from what it tells me. So at F22, five stops puts me at 1.3 seconds. I want to open up one more stop from that, so I just need to double my time and go to two and a half seconds. And that should give me a perfect exposure at F22. It will certainly give me the best possible exposure. It may not look perfect when we review it, but that's the best digital file we can get so that we then bring it into Lightroom or Photoshop just with the adjustments of our sliders. We can bring down the highlights, open up the shadows, and it should look pretty cool. So let's see what we get at two and a half seconds. Okay, so I took another spot meter reading. Nothing's changed. I'm still at F22 at 1 20th of a second for putting the highlights dead center. And we want the highlights at a highlight position on the far right. So what I did was added six stops, three to open up from the highlights, three for my neutral density filter, and I got two and a half seconds. Now, one other thing is if you take a look behind me, we've got very deep shadows, almost going to black. And I know I've got some little extra tonal range in this camera to squeeze out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat. I'm going to open up one more stop and take a chance that I'm not going to clip my highlights because I want to open these shadows. So I'm going to go from two and a half to five seconds. It sounds like a big difference, but it really isn't all that much. Let's do a five second exposure. Five second exposure looks like it might be the winner. So we'll see when we bring it into software. One other thing on the tripod. Ideally in a situation like this, I would have been a little better off having a taller tripod. This center column does extend up, but when you do this, you do add another factor in of a little bit more wobble. Whenever possible, it's best to shoot with the head all the way down. We just needed to do it to be able to clear the railing here. That's why I added the bag underneath to add it a little extra support just to give it more weight down at center so there's no vibrations. And from what I can see, I think it worked pretty well. All right, so I've got my nine stop ND filter on. I put the 70 to 200 lens on here because although we've got the big beautiful falls over there again, as I found shots of entire waterfalls just aren't as interesting as zooming in on some kind of detail. Simplify the image, it makes it clear what you want to show. Now, again, I've got a very stable platform. I'm going to go ahead and add my bag on the hook underneath just to add a little more weight. Okay, let that settle down because we've got to keep moving because Rick's hungry. Okay, so everything's very stable. I've got a bigger lens on here. I don't want to rotate the camera, but I want to shoot some verticals. And that's the beauty of having the lens mounted to the tripod head instead of the camera because then I can just release the lens collar and go to vertical just like that. And again, the beauty of this particular camera is that I've got my digital level right on my readout so I get to see when I'm level. Just want to check my framing a little bit. Zoom in on a nice detail. Give myself a little bit of room on either side. You can always crop later. Can't add it after the fact. So I'm at 30 seconds at F10. 
because again, we're at the nine stop ND filter. So it's really gonna make the water nice and smooth. So now we just wait. All right, a couple more questions. By the way, some of your questions, all the questions are great. Some of them are very involved and maybe take us down paths that are gonna go a little bit off subject or maybe too detailed. We'll give you a way to get a hold of me after the fact. Send me a note, I'd be happy to talk with you or email, whatever works best after the fact. So look for that. Uh, a couple questions I do wanna answer though. Now it's time for the math section of our program. All right, so first of all, real easy. Someone asked, well, how do you calculate three stops? Remember, with the landscape photography, we're generally not going to touch the aperture. We're going to leave that wherever we ended up with. It's the time that we want to change. And since each stop is going to be a doubling in the time, three is pretty easy to do. So if you take a reading with your camera or your meter and you, just, you come up with 1 60th of a second is your perfect exposure without a filter on it, three stops down from that would be... Well, 30th of a second is one stop, 15th of a second would be two stops, and eighth of a second is three stops. Not too bad. You could take that with any number, just half at each time. That's gonna give you your exposure time. Nine stops, however, can start to get a little screwy. Oh, nine stops, because halfway through you end up messing up. How do you calculate nine stops? Bring out your phone. Okay, you guys ready for this? Let's take that same number. Let's imagine it's our, our Base exposure without a filter is 1 60th of a second. So you're gonna have to write this part down. It's not that bad. So divide one by that fraction. So divide one by 60. So I divide one by 60, and that will give me the fraction of one that is 1 60th of a second. In this case on my smartphone, it says it's 0.01666. That's the fraction of 1 60th of a second. Multiply that by 512. You're wondering where the heck did 512 comes from? That is two to the ninth power. Two times two, yeah, trust me on that. Multiply that number by 512. And that will give you an answer in seconds how long your exposure needs to be for nine stops. In this case, eight and a half seconds with a bunch of threes after it, but you don't care. So basically nine seconds. So nine stops open from 1 60th of a second with a nine stop ND filter is gonna be nine seconds. Try it out, but again, just divide the fraction so that you can figure out what the number is. Again, if it's 125th of a second, now let's make it easy. Let's do a simple one. You do your, your ambient light and it's 120th of a second. So divide one by 20 and you get 0.05. If you want to see what nine stops open from that is, multiply it by 512 and it comes back and it tells you it's 25.6 seconds. So if you have 25 seconds, 26, whatever, in that ballpark, that's gonna be fine. And it really does work. It's, it's fairly simple math. So again, remember, three stops, you're just gonna have to half the, half the speed each time. In fact, someone asked why I use F22, because it is true, on a lot of lenses, if you close them all the way down, you actually lose some quality. Most lenses are best in their middle range, say F8 to F16. This is a Zeiss lens that I'm using. F22 in this lens is crystal clear sharp. I've tested it. If you find that that's not the case with your lens, then by all means, open up a little bit. 16, F16, F14, something like that. You need to test and that all comes down to knowing how your equipment operates. Someone else brings up a good point. Is there a problem using those step down rings that I mentioned with the lens shade? The answer is yes. The lens shade's not gonna fit on there in some cases. So you have to go without. But generally, again, with neutral density filters, you're not generally shooting into the sun or having the sun hit the lens, so it's not usually an issue. Let's see. There's a couple of questions about graduated neutral density filters. Sure, you can use that. Someone asked, should I use the graduated neutral density filter to knock down the high contrast? That's great if you have a complete horizon. If you've got the sky and a horizon and the sky's bright and the foreground's dark, graduated neutral density will work well. The problem in the waterfall shot was we had the top of the falls bright, but on either side it was still kind of dark. So a graduated neutral density filter would have affected that as well. So why do I choose not to use a lens hood? It depends on the lighting conditions. I do usually use a lens hood. If I'm out in the bright sun, I will do it. Uh, if I'm off in the shade though, like we were in most of these falls, I was not in direct sunlight at all. 
in some cases, I was using a, a neutral density filter with a polarizer. It allows me to adjust the polarizer, and it allows me to change filters easily. So yes, I do usually use the lens shade. Uh, it's a good idea. So somebody asked, would a three-stop ND filter be a better buy as a first filter or a two-stop? If you had to start with one, I'd say go to a three. Two stops is fine. One and two stop filters are more useful for video. They're gonna bring the light down just a little bit. If you really wanna start slowing down light, I think you're better off starting off with a three if that's the one you're gonna use. Okay, let's continue on because we're gonna completely change pace. And by the way, I see I'm running a little late. We're gonna end up going a little past an hour. If you have to leave, don't worry, it's been recorded. We'll let you know when the recording's posted. So. I had so much fun at this set of falls. As I mentioned, I took a workshop class there this past weekend. Once again, the light was beautiful. Everyone got great shots. By the way, I prefer to shoot waterfalls in overcast or even misty or even light rain rather than sunlight. I find that bright patches of sunlight end up competing with the flow of the water unless they're in exactly the right place. So don't let overcast skies or even a little rain stop you from going out and photographing. So now it's time for a complete change of pace. Now, even though I worked in Manhattan for several years, I do prefer peace and quiet in nature. That said, there's of course a lot to photograph in urban areas. So to contrast our waterfalls, I spent a day recently in New York City and captured a completely different kind of flow. I chose two main locations, Grand Central Station and Times Square with some stops in between. It was a warm evening in early October and the city was absolutely full of life. Now I chose a different type of support system for this trip as well. So let me reintroduce again the Enduro Hi-Hat. As I said, I admit that when I first saw this thing, I had no idea why I'd want one. Once I started using it, I realized once again that doing this webinar was gonna cost me money. I love this thing and just had to have one. First of all, again, as I mentioned, strong and stable, but it takes up very little room. And a lot of times the police in urban areas don't like seeing tripods. Even though you're technically allowed to use it, they'll give you grief. The small size kept people from tripping over it. Also, these little legs, these little feet, the way they adapt allows you to put this easily on a curved surface. So when the, there were times that I didn't want it on the ground and I wanted to have it a little higher, I just find a ledge or even a garbage can. And in New York City, there's garbage cans with these curved tops. This sit right on the top, perfectly stable. Since it can get so low to the ground, it just makes it very easy to capture really interesting points of view without me having to lie on the street. And again, going back to my camera, one of the reasons I love using this is, as I mentioned in the video, I don't have to get my knees dirty. I can just bring out the articulated screen put the camera on the ground and actually look at it from above. I brought this with me to capture a new perspective. In fact, I loved it so much in the city that I went back to the falls this weekend. I used, this was the only tripod I used. So let's head to New York City and capture the flow of time with a completely different feel. So here we are in Times Square on a very warm October evening. It's in the 60s. It's like a Warm, almost a warm summer evening. And I came here to try to do some long exposures to see if I could pause that flowing of time. Now earlier we were here in the daytime, the sun was still up. We got some really interesting results. Uh, what was a challenge here at night is the tonal range here in Times Square with all the signs is so crazy different. Uh, I measured using my sconic meter. I put it on spot metering mode. And with the bright signs, I was getting a 60th of a second at, F, at uh, F14. My shadows, and not even my deep shadows, the shadows that I wanted to actually record detail, I was getting from six to eight seconds. I'm talking nine stops of tonal range, which is way more than the camera could actually capture in a single shot. So what I found myself doing with some of my three and four minute exposures was I took two shots. The first one, I did my long exposure, and then the signs blew out because of the, long, because of the tonal range. Then I did an exposure just for the signs so that I can composite them later. And we'll see what the results look like. It should be kind of cool, but it's really been a fun experience. And I really couldn't have done it with that. The meter, uh, it really told me what I needed to know. And also with my intervalometer so that I can use this as a, a bulb shutter lock. Uh, and also just to have a countdown timer. And that would let me know the combination of the meter and the intervalometer. 
gave me my exposure information. Since all these exposures took a while, they really made things go longer. So, fun, uh, fun evening in New York City. It was a great time. Uh, a couple more questions. We're running a little late, but we're getting close. Uh, first of all, someone asked me about uh, what do I think about the light meter applications for the smartphones? Do they work? Uh, it's a good question. I haven't tested them any yet. Uh, I can't imagine they're going to be as good as my handheld meters, but stay tuned. I'll, I'll give them a shot. Uh, someone asked, at what point does extra exposure time really make no difference in the silkiness of, of flowing water? Uh, you're gonna, that's a, a good question. You're going to have to test that. My experience was, and again, it depends on the speed of the water, but in the falls that we were doing, I found that once we got up to about 13 to 15 seconds or so, after that, it really didn't look any different. Uh, so again, obviously in New York City, it did. Uh, there was a big difference between 15 seconds, especially when there was a lot of traffic not moving uh, between that and 10 minutes. But for the water, I found uh, 10 to 15 seconds. I didn't see much of a difference beyond that. Uh, someone asked if a, a smaller aperture uh, is sometimes useful for a greater bokeh. Bokeh are those uh, little blobs of light you get in the distance when, when something's out of focus. Uh, or, or would that add too much of a dreamy look? Actually, you're going to get bokeh when you have a wide open aperture, not a tiny aperture. Generally for me, for landscapes, one of the, the things about a landscape is that the image needs to be sharp from the very foreground to the very background. So it's not something I would typically do. But don't let me stop you. Give it a try. I'd love to see what you come up with. Uh, let's see. Someone again set, asked about settings used for the 25-second uh, the exposures and the 5- the, the and 10-minute exposures in Times Square. Again, always 100 ISO. I was always doing that. Uh, and my aperture ranged, in some, uh, ranged there from 14 to f22. Uh, but it was always at least f14. And let's see. Yeah, I think that's, that's about it with the questions. So if, if what I was just doing looks like a lot of fun, it really is. Uh, I still prefer nature, and I realize that I, something's happened to me. Maybe it's because I'm getting older. I'm not an adrenaline junkie anymore. I've become a peace and quiet junkie. I still do love New York City, though, and I need my city fix now and again. But regardless of what your preference is, I hope you've been inspired to try out some of these tools. Remember, your camera, your still camera, can do two things that your eyes can't do. One, your camera can freeze the smallest fraction of time and allow you to examine that passing moment in detail. Your camera can also take the passage of time that we've seen today and present you a span of time into a single photograph so you can see what happens over that period of time. Let your own interests and curiosity take you somewhere unique. And you just might capture an image that will shed new light on things that are often missed. 
Now, in addition to being a lot of fun, I learned a lot more about these techniques by focusing on them over the past month. The flowing water results really came out beautifully. So we can see some waterfall shots here. They just created sort of a sense of peace that are really, really nice. And by the way, if you're looking to sell photographs, something like that is very sellable because they are so peaceful. On the other hand, the city shots. Sometimes they're intriguing. Uh, uh, the, the shot that maybe you saw earlier of the bridge. Here we see uh, Grand Central and in Times Square. They're intriguing, and sometimes they even get a little bit eerie at, at times. I'm going to continue to experiment and play, and I can't, see, uh, can't wait to see what comes next. I know for sure that moving forward, my three-stop and nine-stop neutral density filters are going to be in my bag at all times. I'd like to thank Sakonic, Benro, and Enduro for sponsoring us today. We couldn't have done this without them. And also, I want to thank you. Great questions. Thank you for your interest. That's why we're here. As I mentioned, I had a few of you join me this past weekend for some great photography, and I hope to be able to meet more of you at workshops in the future. I'm going to leave you today with some of my favorite images that show the passage of time. So until next time, keep exploring, keep shooting, and be well. Bye-bye.